afternoon, everybody. It's 12 o'clock, West Coast. Time to rock. On behalf of SF Big, welcome to a wonderful Wednesday. Some intelligence and insights on a panel uh, that we have, have not had as much interest in it as we've had in this particular session in well over a year. I think the, the, the controversy over cookies and not cookies and Apple and Google and everybody has got the pot stirred and, uh, and it's simmering. We are very lucky today to have four people that I think are going to have a really interesting conversation moderated by one of my favorite people in this business. And I, I'm very excited. We've got, you know, flash talking, Verizon Media, T-Mobile Marketing Solutions. We, and but it's going to be led by Sarah at, at uh, Media Matters, who's going to basically introduce the panelists. And I, she'll go over the ground rules. But let's sit back and talk about this particular issue, because this is something that affects us all, something that we're all thinking about. How many times have you gone to a website lately and says, do you accept cookies or not accept cookies? And you talk to Joe and Jane on the street and they truly don't know what to do. I think those of us in the ad business sometimes don't know what to do. So Sarah, uh, thank you on behalf of Big for taking this, this really fascinating conversation over and uh, let's rock and roll. Awesome. Thank you, John. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. And I see we still have folks um, pouring in. Uh, I'm really happy to be here today to talk about what I think is probably the biggest disruption to our industry and our work that um, at least I've experienced. Um, I first want to start by letting our panelists introduce themselves um, and tell you, tell you a little bit about what they do. And then we'll dive in. Um, we'll do about you know, 40, 45 minutes of um, panel discussion and then we'll have time at the end for questions. So please um, send us through your questions in the chat and we'll get to those at the end. And we'll start off by um, Gio, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, hello everybody. Thanks for having me today. Uh, I am Gio from the product team at uh, Verizon Media. Uh, my team is responsible for all our identity and targeting solutions, uh, and we've been uh, we've been keeping busy for the last couple of years, uh, trying to future-proof um, all our business, basically, and um, and uh, you know buying and selling ads. Great, thanks. Next, we've got Brandon Zirko from T-Mobile. Hey everybody, Brandon Zirkel. I lead our strategy and partnerships team at T-Mobile Marketing Solutions across identity, measurement, and ad tech partners in the eco space. And we are we're building some very interesting products um, around around this space specifically that are future proofed and 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 cookieless. So very excited to talk. About today with with the panel about um, about how everybody else is approaching the space uh, because we're 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 super interested in uh, in making sure that we have room for collaboration in, in the products that we're building. Great thanks Brenda. And last but certainly not least Steve Latham at Flash Talking probably maybe pioneering um, the cookie list world. Can we give us a little intro Steve? Love that intro. We're gonna, I think we're going to use it. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, hi, everybody. Steve Latham, Head Up Analytics, uh, Flash Talking. Uh, came there six years ago now uh, through acquisition from the attribution side. Last probably three, four months, really focused on the identity strategy, go to market, um, and really help. We're helping connect all these, you know, with the replacement of cookies and maids to, to move to 30, 40, 50, 60 different forms of identity. And how do you stitch all that together to make the data useful from a measurement, from a personalization, optimization, et cetera. So really excited to be talking today. Awesome. I'm so glad you're here, all three of you. And I failed to introduce myself. Um, I am Sarah Owens. I lead the analytics team at Media Matters, a boutique agency based in the Bay. Um, very, I'm a newbie on the block there. Um, previously, I was at Wavemaker, a big gun agency, um, leading up the analytics team on the West Coast. Um, and I've been spending, you know, most of my career, I've been in analytics and media and doing things like, um, you know, measuring success of campaigns, uh, building out audience strategies, doing audience research and intelligence, activation strategies, audience architectures. 
lots of things that rely on third-party cookies and unique identifiers being able to be synced across platforms. So um, this topic is, is near and dear to my heart as it probably is for all of you here. Uh, so let's dive in. I think the first place I'd love to start is just very, very high level. A lot is changing right now, right? When it comes to identity and consent, we have GDPR, we have this imminent Chrome um, announcement with no third party cookies. Apple's already made a bunch of changes. Um, let's just level set for our audience and talk about like what has already changed and then what is coming next. And I'll give that to Brandon. Thanks, Sarah. Um, what has already changed, I think, um, we're definitely at an inflection point, right? Um, I would just say, um, everybody remain calm. <laughs> we're, we're, we're gonna be okay. There's solutions out there um, that, are, uh, that are cropping up that allow us to, to continue to remain addressable in certain portions. And we're gonna talk through some of those today. Um, but I, th I think in terms of cookies specifically, cookies were never a, real, a great identifier, right? Um, they're they're domain specific. Uh, they required cookie mapping across <laughs> every platform, every publisher, every marketer, measurement provider had to map cookies in order to to sync identities. And um, when when maids came along, um, maids maids were actually made. It's, it's in the name, right? Identifier for advertising. Um, maids and and now CTV IDs are are much better. Um, identifiers for creating modern, uh, a modern approach to advertising. And I think that's, that's one form of identity that, that continues to persist post cookie. I know IDFA is on, on the Apple side. Uh, there's going to be, there's going to be challenges because of opt-in and, and thanks to Apple for convincing everyone that, um, that the app open internet is full of uh, evil data mongers, which, which, which isn't entirely true. Um, but but maids and, and CTVs and, and forward-looking email-based identifiers are, uh, are going to create a portion of addressability for, for how we go forward with respect to, to media buying. Yeah. And I suspect a lot of people have this question um, because there's a lot of talk about cookies and the cookie-less future. It's actually not all cookies that are being deprecated by Google Chrome. Um, and actually, they're already, it's, it's third party cookies, right? So, Steve, can you tell our audience what is the difference between first and third party cookies? Sure, yeah. So, first party cookie is basically when someone comes to your domain, if you're the, the brand and they come to your site, you have a first party relationship with them. So, that's a first party cookie, which all browsers are fine with. That's how you, you know, saves your login information and makes it easier to personalize content on the site. Third party is really where a third party, like an ad tech vendor or data provider is capturing the data through a cookie. And that's a different, the, the cookie is set from a different domain, different namespace. And that's where you get into, I think cross domain and uh, same site is a better way of thinking about it these days. You hear that more like cross domain cookies. Uh, mm -hmm. Cause there's a lot of, a lot of little uh, ITP. If you guys remember Apple was really just, in, implemented to to cut down on a lot of the little workarounds where people are doing like cross domain uh, first party cookies and and a lot of the little tricks there to try to continue to capture people um, you know even though it wasn't actually your domain but under the first party cookie header so it's changed a lot um, but at the end of the day I think everyone says first party data it's a direct relationship either between the consumer and the the brand on their site or the publisher and that's so one of the you know one of the big opportunities we'll be looking at is obviously connecting first syncing first party cookies to first party data, so you can actually you know have direct relationships and advertise that way. But uh, yeah, the third party days of third party cross domain cookies. You know we we've known the drumbeat's been going for quite a while. Um, you know Apple Apple started blocking third party impression cookies in 2014. It was seven years ago. Like we've been basically dark and and Safari uh, impression activity. So in terms of being able to uh, tie that back to identity, back to, to a conversion, for example. So this is not new. This is just continuation of, you know, the, the way things have been going. And um, to what Brandon said, um, we're going to, you know, the internet is, uh, you know, internet advertising is evolving. It will continue to, we'll continue to innovate. Um, I think we all agree that 
that definitely, you know, it, it, we do need to do better jobs in the industry from a privacy standpoint. Uh, we need a bit, bit better job of letting consumers know they're being tracked. We need to do a better job of, of honoring their wishes, make it easy for them to take, to take action and have choice. So those are a lot of things we'll talk about this, you know, in this session, but it all goes back to, you know, starting with these forms of identity that, that Brandon and Joe are referring to and, and just what's next, right? So that's, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks for clarifying that. Um, I mean, I think, you know, with disruption always comes innovation or opportunity to innovate, right? So we can either try to um, reinvent what we, what third-party cookies and maids and all these identifiers do, or we, there could be some great new uh, innovation. Um, and I think that the disruption really affects kind of two, when we think about advertising, two areas, uh, audiences and how we identify and activate audiences and even understand them, and then measurement. Um, let's dive into audience first. I'm already hearing a ton of um, potential solutions out there. There's, you know, sort of like the cohort approach um, with Google Flocks, for example. There's ID consortiums being developed. Um, a lot of partners are just talking about, you know, better contextual targeting. Uh, Gio, this question is for you. What, what do you think of these solutions? Um, like, what do you think is promising and what do you think um, is, is maybe truly innovative versus just an attempt at replacement? Sure. So at, at a high level, we, we try to bucket solutions uh, into, in through three categories. And every time we speak to, we, we talk to a partner or a vendor, we ask them in which bucket they, uh, you know, they, fall, uh, they fall into. Uh, there's, there are solutions that try to preserve identity in a deterministic way. Uh, that's where email-based identifiers come in. Uh, there are solutions that, that try to preserve identity in a probabilistic way, uh, using a combination of IP, user agent, um, and other variables to try to infer uh, who the user is. Uh, and then there are solutions that try to embrace the lack of identity and help you know, buyers and sellers trade in the absence of an identifier. Uh, and we like to start from the problem because, you know, the solutions that give themselves the same name actually operate in different buckets. Uh, again, there's a lot of um, IDs, uh, universal or unified uh, in market, but, you know, some are deterministic, uh, some are probabilistic, and we even heard of some IDs that are actually contextual. Uh, and so just, you know, uh, an identifier can mean a lot of different things uh, for a lot of different companies. When it comes to cohorts, uh, they tend to be more on the on, on the less deterministic side. Uh, so, you know, a cohort is a group of people, so uh, there shouldn't be a one-to-one -one addressability. Uh, that's the case with flocks, um, uh, but and they try to preserve uh, some of the audience targeting capabilities that are available today. Uh, not all, uh, but uh, but a portion of them. Um, and then, you know, contextual uh, is, uh, is something we are more used to and familiar with. Um, and uh, that's, you know, the type of solutions that tend to focus on the lack uh, of identity and addressability and still preserve uh, some, some forms of, uh, of targeting. Um, and, you know, on top of those, you know, three identity buckets, I think the other dimension is the one you mentioned, which is what problem are solutions trying to solve? Are they trying to solve for audience targeting? Are they trying to solve for measurement? Uh, I would add a third one, which, you, which we hear more and more, especially from the brand buyers, which is frequency management. Uh, how, you know, how do brands, how can they control exposure and making sure they don't uh, waste budgets uh, by, by targeting the same user over and over? Um, and again, it's kind of like a three by three matrix and different solutions, you know, play in different uh, uh, quadrants. Um, and that's, that's kind of the framework that I like to use personally. And we like to use at Verizon Media when we, uh, when we talk to partners and vendors and, and try to place them on the map basically and figure out how they can help us. Great. Brandon or Steve, anything to build on there? Yeah, I think, I mean, the reality is there's going to be different identifiers that make a portion of the available inventory that we can all buy on or bid against addressable. 
And some of those are going to be in different addressability pools, and, and there's not going to be a common identifier that ties across those pools, as, as Steve and Gio pointed out. Um, so the days, like Steve already said, I mean, we used to live in this, this fantasy land. It was reality for, for a long time, even now, um, where 100% of inventory is, is almost ubiquitous, ubiquitously addressable, 100% um, addressability. Uh, you've got thousands, sometimes <laughs> tens of thousands of data attributes linked to every every single ID that's uh, that's passing through in real time, and you can do lookups and 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 targeting against the, those multitude of attributes. Those days are gone, but that's that's not a a huge problem because we don't need 100% coverage 100% of the time, right? There's there's ways to get um, more sophisticated with the portions that are continuing to be addressable and then have a portfolio approach with your media buying that spans into some of these other categories like indexed-based contextual buying where you, you may have a, a portion of uh, audience data that's enabled, it's able to inform how you would uh, how you would buy contextually. And you, you can then map those attributes to things like site and time of day and device type and et cetera. And then there's the cohort strategy, which I think is an interesting move it, by Google to protect everybody's privacy, um, but protect also protects them from, um, uh, from being scrutinized in a way like, Google's the only one that's able to to inform the algorithms for for how those cohorts are created, and I think there's still that that needs to be a part of everybody's strategy. How do you optimize with cohorts as part of your broader media plan? But but we also need flexibility to adjust um, within particular cohorts and and potentially the ability to create custom uh, custom cohorts uh, across. So. Um, in general, it's a portfolio approach and you have to work with partners who know how to optimize across those, those portfolio of approaches. Can I build on this, Sarah? The, uh, cause I think there's really two sides of the equation you have to think about when it comes to identity. Um, and most of us think about the buying side of it, about find the right audiences and, um, and buying them. And, and in the, in the past where you'd be able to reach, you know, pretty much everybody you wanted through cookies and maids, now, with when we move to new forms of IDs, like consented IDs, like cached emails being one of the most notable ones, um, of course, the long guy comes up at resident speaking. Hope that's not too obnoxious in the background. Um, so the, the, uh, the buying side is going to be really um, not as hard to solve for as the measurement side, because you'll be able to buy through, like, for example, Trade Desk came out, you could buy an Epsilon ID, you could buy UID2, you could buy, they'll have more IDs, right? You'll be able to buy probably new store IDs, library ID IDs, you'll be able to buy all these IDs through your, through DSP. And it's great, The but to Brandon's point earlier, you're going to be buying the same person, Geo as well, on the reach, on the frequency side, you're going to be buying Sarah through three different identity providers, thinking your reach is three, it's actually one, and your frequency is three, right? So that's, so you, the, they talk about interoperability of IDs is, is one of the big challenges is IABs trying to figure this out um the the all the the industry orgs are uh, arf they're all trying to figure out identity and how do we talk advise and guide on it because um interoperability from a buying side won't be too hard you can just start buying all these ideas but the problem is how do you then determine that actually sarah got three different uh, ads from three different identity providers and she's actually the same person not three different people and that's really where assembling and stitching those ids back to a common backbone a cookie-less backbone from a measurement standpoint is really critical. So, so Brandon, not to not to debate you a bit, like there actually is there are solutions to, to connect IDs back to um, to uh, you know to align them from the different ID spaces, and that's really the core of our, our identity framework, which is based on FTRAC, our probabilistic identity solution. So we using probabilistic models can say, okay, this same user that just got uh, someone bought them via new star ID, via live star ID, live live ramp ID, via a trade desk or UID2, that's actually the same user and we can stitch all those back to our common probabilistic identifier for that user. So we can then get back to the advertiser, here is your actual reach and your frequency and your attribution. So now you actually can, you're not, you can still buy across all these ID spaces and connect all that back to a common ID and have a really high degree of, of transparency and visibility into your buying and most importantly the measurement so you can optimize your buys against that. So that that's the part that where the measurement side of it 
Um, the interoperability is really one of the big challenges that I think advertisers are going to run to next year. And that's really where we've been focusing our efforts is to solve for that. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought up measurement because that I think that's probably getting the least uh, attention sort of in the press and all the conversations I've been in with clients um, within the walls of, of where I work. Um, but measurement just keeps me up at night. And it's interesting because just, you know, in some ways, well, no, just really, this is already in play, right? Like that, that idea of like reach is understated and frequency is overstated when you're trying to measure across a, clan, a campaign, number one, because we already have wall gardens like Facebook, Google, all the social platforms where you can't understand, okay, I reached a user um, on ESPN and this is the same user on Facebook, right? Um, so that problem is getting more pervasive. Um, frequency, Gio, you mentioned this earlier and Steve, you just touched on it again. I can, that, for me, that falls into measurement because when we're planning, when you, when we're planning a media campaign, we have a budget um, and we're figuring out like, okay, what's the wisest way to spend this investment to, to drive success that our clients are looking for? I mean, the building blocks of that is reach and frequency, right? Who is your target audience? What is the size of them? What is the effective number of times you need to reach them omnichannel? And therefore, how do you plan your media? And then once you do that, if you, we have no way to really know what, what frequency we're achieving. Um, like, yeah, what, what do you think, um, are there early, are there early solutions emerging that get at measuring that frequency in the cookie list world? Yeah, if I could, yeah, just to continue. So we, we've been dealing with this with cookies for years, right? So people who buy third-party cookies, if you're serving into iOS or in app, um, you know, you're getting a, a null value back. So we've been solving for this with cookie rejection for years. Now it's just really applying that same approach to multiple IDs. You're still stitching together uh, multiple cookies that where your Apple device thinks it's a new user each time. So it keeps generating a new cookie ID. You're like, it's actually the same user. It's just five different cookie IDs, but it's really one user, one device. So the same thing that um, for identity stitching for the purpose of um, resolving identity in a cookie list environment against cookies, it's just taking that same thing to the multiple IDs and syncing with those IDs. So we, our intention is to work with all of the identity partners, all the, especially the deterministic partners, syncing IDs so we can uh, stitch all that together for the advertisers and their agencies to do, so they can actually have a, a reliable data set for analytics. So it's, it's being done today. We've been doing it for years. It's just really applying a, a methodology that's worked really well with cookies now to different um, deterministic IDs. Got it. Um, I, think, I think that we have to be careful on that front though, because fingerprinting methodologies that are used to continue to do that in the you know, forward-looking time and space <laughs> Are, are going to be subject to increasing regulatory pressure. And we have to, I think we, as an industry, we have to respect that. And we have to, we have to know that there's a reason why these changes are happening. It's because identities, unless they are fully consented and, a, and, and there's transparency and choice given to the consumers for that specific action to link them, then we probably shouldn't be linking them, and we should be we should be operating in a way that respects that um, that consumer choice. Because because otherwise um, we're going to continue to face increasing regulatory pressures Absolutely. as an industry. So, Randy, we agree one hundred percent. We are we are completely aligned. Um, and th this is actually one of the big problems with the industry is we've been. You know, we have an ad choices icon for the buy, but we, there's nothing for for the audience tag or the or the analytics tag that's also capturing data, or the uh, you know audience or the location ID that's the, or provider that's capturing data. So um, this is something we we we've actually recently published a, a privacy a white paper that which says every impression should have notice and choice in it. So we've actually created our own privacy icon for that purpose to comp to really co complement the ad choices, which is a good idea, but not always the best execution. Uh, so that every ad should have notice uh, that you're being tracked and here's who's tracking you and here's how to opt out. It should be easy. It shouldn't be a 150 different vendors that you have to you know, get overwhelmed by. It's like, here's actually who's tracking you on this ad. 
Um, we agree hundred percent. And, and if, and if on the fingerprinting, uh, you know, that, that word's kind of been hijacked, but the way Google defines it today, it's really about, um, it's about subversive, um, you know, opaque or hidden techniques, not providing notice choice, capturing data to sell it without the, without informing the users. We agree that, that those bad practices need to be rooted out because that's, what's hurting us as an industry. It's hurting open advertising and all the good actors are being, you know, unfortunately painted with a bad, with a, uh, broad brush because of the actions of a few bad actors. So we're all for, you know, I think we're all aligned that we need to do a better job of, of explaining, you know, the, the value exchange, free content for ads. You can pay for content or you can get it ad supported. You choose. Everyone wants ad supported content um, for like news and weather and, and maps and, and all the, the, and games, all these things. People are okay with that value exchange, but they, they tend to forget that. And then we've got to provide the notice and the ability to opt out if they wish. Uh, if we do those things better, we, we, you know, if we've been doing those things better all these years, I think we'd be in a better place today, but it's not too late. And I think that this is something that we are, you know, in violent agreement with you that we, this is something that's, it's just got to be done much better across the industry. Um, I mean, protecting user um, privacy and consent is obviously the root of this. Um, Geo, you talked before about the buckets. Um, they're being deterministic, probabilistic, um, and then just embracing no identity. Um, in terms of like a you know a future scenario, uh, where which do you think we live in all three of those, or do you think one is going to prevail? Um, well, there's there's definitely going to be multiple parallel futures. Um, Starting from non-addressable, um, ultimately, um, both Apple from a, a App Store perspective and the browsers have already told loud and clear that they are not happy with deterministic or probabilistic identity. Uh, and you know there is a significant portion of supply with no registered users or no consent, if you look at iOS, uh, where those methodologies cannot apply. And and we. We believe that you know in a year from now, non-addressable supply it's going to be over seventy percent of the total. Uh, so that's definitely a future and a big one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's uh, you know the opposite scenario where identity can be preserved with uh, deterministic identifiers, which we believe it's going to be important uh, in the medium term, um, and you know that's that's going to enable advertisers to preserve everything they do today uh, in terms of frequency management, uh, targeting and, uh, and measurement, but it's gonna apply to a, to a small portion of, uh, of supply. Um, and then the, 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 you know, the probabilistic identity space, it's uh, probably gonna be, remain big in the short term, uh, but you know, as, as browsers and as Apple are getting better at blocking all the signals that are being used uh, for probabilistic identity, uh, think of, you know, Apple obfuscating IPs that just announced it last week or Google obfuscating the user agent and replacing it with client hints, which they announced a few months ago. Uh, that's going to be harder and harder. So we do believe in the short term, all three buckets are going to be uh, valuable. Um, we believe long term, it's going to be a little bit more black and white. So either deterministic identity on a small pocket of supply and no identity whatsoever on the majority of the supply and uh, and buyers will have to figure out how to how to buy both and sellers will have to figure out how to sell both with different uh, techniques and methodologies to you know preserve as many of the capabilities that uh, uh, that we have today mm -hmm. yeah I mean it's just a um, advocate for my clients I'm trying to measure success I don't it seems like a world where you know, only a portion of the impressions we run, we can measure um, or even understand what audience you reached and what the overlap is with other. Like it, it just that that's not you know we need it's not going to work. <laughs> well, you know, I I think we will get better at working with samples and with aggregations, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, one thing I always tell my team to see the glass of full is you know over. The last decades, as an industry, we learned how to trade 
TV ads. We learned how to trade print. We learned how to trade billboards uh, outdoor. We learned how to, you know, buy filters on Snapchat or, or influencer marketing, right? All those channels present even more challenges when it comes to targeting or addressability. Many of them don't even have a sample to begin with. So um, I think web still has a, a great future. Uh, and I, I think there's still a lot of sophistication that can be applied to digital channels that cannot be applied at all to traditional ones. Uh, as you said at the, at, the, at the very beginning, it's just a matter of you know, embracing the future and, and innovating together uh, and finding together what, you know, what those new solutions can be. Uh, but I don't know, I, 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 feel fairly, I feel fairly optimistic about, again, what we can do as an industry to, to prepare for the future. Yeah, it, it, it's a great point. I mean, I think we often forget in the in the programmatic digital age that we live in that there was an ad industry that was um, that was that was succeeding and um, in, in the dominant linear TV ad industry that was, grew to something like seventy billion dollars in the U.S. market size and and the the entire industry was pinned on Nielsen ratings, which was like a 30,000 household panel. I mean, you talk about not being able to measure 100% of your impressions, Sarah, but <laughs> we, we've proven that we can do, we, we, can, we can spend advertising somewhat effectively, even with zero, almost zero addressability and almost zero real measurement at all. And today, as Gio just said, we have, we have capabilities, right? We have sample, we, we have deterministic, sample-based audience sets that are addressable, that can be measured. And even if, if you're extrapolating the results of that sample audience to, to inform your larger measurement strategy, and then you're, stitch, you're stitching together those, uh, those bucketed inventory pools that you can measure independently, and, and maybe you can extract insights across the pools, those types of methodologies are, are going to be way more sophisticated than um, and what, what the old TV industry was was pinned on back in back in the day, and um, and and when you combine that with, as I mentioned before, CTV IDs and and maids that that are still prevalent and and are much better identifiers uh, from a construct than than cookies in the first place. There, there's a lot of room to work there, and you, I, I think as marketers we need to find uh, partners that know how to optimize those different nuances across the different pools of both audience and inventory and formats and understand how to make make things work it's not it's no longer going to be programmatic point and click plug and play your campaign runs everywhere and it's auto optimized and hit every single target every single audience you're going to have to do a lot of testing and learning across different pools and you're going to have to work with a partner who understands how to test and learn across those different pools. That's what we're building at T-Mobile, by the way. We're building the Magenta Audience Network that, that is activated on the open internet. And we are, we're actually putting our own first party data into that platform to power it so that it spans all the different inventory pools and formats so we can extract insights on, on those campaigns and, and use it to, to leverage buying across these different identity types. Yeah, you're speaking my language. Um, you know, I think we talk about explicit or, or deterministic versus probabilistic. Um, we, I don't think cookies were ever really a very elegant solution for deterministic um, identification or measurement, right? Because cookies don't last forever, they have a short lifespan. Um, we've talked about, you know, Safari has been blocking cookies for years, a lot of people use incognito. Um, so you're already, you know, there's already a lot of, and then, and then you've got to save cookies between multiple platforms and there's drop off and match rates. And um, I love probabilistic solutions. I love modeling, uh, but I feel like it gets a bad rap. Um, and I wonder, Steve, if you, if you hear that um, from. No, never, never, never heard anything about fingerprinting or anything. No, and back to <clears throat> the comment about fingerprinting, like what it, it's really important to distinguish um, for example, like our position, like we are, our, 
our job as Flash Talking is really to represent the advertiser's need for the data they need to make informed decisions about the media and creative, right? Period, mm -hmm. the end. That's what we do. Deliver it, you know, we're the source of truth for measurement, for, for reach, frequency, post view conversions. Uh, we provide the data sets for advanced analytics. We're not selling data, we don't sell media. So, from a, you know, what, when GDPR parlance like a legitimate interest, we've always had a legitimate interest to capture data for those purposes because we protect it, we honor privacy, and we're not using it for, for the, the subversive uh, purposes that most data, you know, that most of these, these uh, legislation or these, these um, policies were, were put in place to protect consumers against. So we, we definitely come at it as the white hats in the industry, like, the, you know, we're, we're trying on the, 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 the on the, the side of good here. And we're, we're also at the same time realizing that we as an industry, we just have to do a, you know, a better job of educating consumers. When it comes to probabilistic, um, it's not the data you capture, but it's really how you use, what, how you use the data and then and, and for what purpose, right? So we, uh, for us, the, you know, Gio mentioned like that, the, the, you know, we've been spent, spent a lot of time this week studying Apple's latest announcement. You can imagine like, you know, and, and honestly, like I've, I've I've been researching myself the last three days because that's kind of the biggest uh, the fire to put out recently. And the reality is like, it, it's really a marketing statement. I mean, they're, they're saying, well, this is going to be part of iCloud Plus. So if you pay for extra storage, iCloud Plus, it will be an option that's in there the time in terms of scrambling the IP and the, 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 this kind of obfuscate your, uh, your email address, which is our direct shot at, the, at all the consented ID providers that, you know, publishers and the advertisers are trying to get, you know, match up people based on hash email addresses. Um, but those are, again, those are going to be, it's all part of Apple's branding around privacy and kudos to them as a shareholder. I love them as a, as a, someone who's looking at some of the things they're doing to make, uh, free content more and more difficult for consumers to get. And that's, that's, that's going to be the, the end of all of this, I think is they have a vested interest in hurting, you know, making advertising less attractive to app developers. So they have to move to paid content of which Apple does collect a huge tax. So it's a little disingenuous in my opinion. I love the company, but I don't like this move. I feel like this is, we, we agree with Tim Cook. Consumers should, should, should be notified that they're being tracked. That's easily done, Tim. We, we've already solved for that. Why do you have to then also, you know, take your, your guns out and shoot them at, at the ad community? Because like at the end of the day, consumers want free content and they're willing to give up a little bit of privacy. And um, especially if you're notifying them of, of, of what data you're capturing and, and who's capturing what purpose, you get a good equilibrium, right? That is, that is the goal. That's what it should be. Open advertising, you know, should be, you know, ad supported content. If you want no ads, great, pay the premium fee and, and get, get your, I pay for Spotify, right? Cause I get tired of audio ads, but if you don't use, use Pandora and get your ads, you have choices, right? So that's, we view that, that, there's, you've got to look at the big picture. You can't just say, oh, fingerprinting is bad. Fingerprinting for the purpose of helping advertisers not waste their media budget if you're respecting privacy. There's, no one can argue with that. No, everyone's arguments are, well, they don't know they're being tracked. Well, if they know they're being tracked and they can opt out and that data is not being used in surreptitious ways, what's the harm? There's no harm. What's the good? It, it allows them to add supported content models to work. Everybody wins. So we, we're, we're, a lot of this is about education. I think um, we love when people bring these, these issues up. We're like, look how Google defines in their uh, blog post on on privacy. Like we agree with that. Those practices of you know uh, the the bad actors that what used to be you know what's now called the fingerprinters. We agree those those are those should be um, shut down. But that, that's not us. We don't do those things. So we feel like you know, and we have a good working relationship with Google. Like we they we are their only independent. Uh, competitor, and in this day and age, with with antitrust concerns, like they need an independent competitor. They, they, it doesn't benefit them to uh, to decapitate anybody that, that's also trying to provide alternatives to their platform. So I think in the end of the day, they kind of they want healthy, you know, healthy competition to point to. Um, Apple, you know, has not been under the same scrutiny um, yet. I think again, huge fan, <laughs> but at the same time, um, I just feel like it's, it's very disingenuous. And at the end of the day, if they weren't benefiting economically, I would give them more benefit of the doubt, but this is directly to drive the services revenue. So this is, this is what's kind of irritating to me. So, sorry, I'll get off my soapbox. It's just very personal and, and affects a lot of things. No, I actually wasn't even, I was thinking more about when I say probabilistic, it's a bad rap. I was thinking about measurement because I hear, what I, this is, I love this. Oh, question. yeah, sorry, right, so I totally missed that, yeah. <laughs> I thought you were talking about identity, probabilistic identifiers. Sorry. No, I, 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 Geo hit on the head and, and Brandon, like, like we've been measuring performance using probabilistic models, marketing mix for 
decades. I mean, if anything, the marketing mix folks are probably really excited about what's going on because they're like, what we're doing is going to become more and more relevant again. <clears throat> but it's a combination. You need your top down marketing mix, and your bottom up, uh, more user level analysis, and you find the, the happy medium in the middle. And that's, that's the goal of unified measurement. So we're getting there. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, we are guessing this is, you know, we really are, we're making guesses at who we reach with media and if we've changed their hearts and minds and if we've moved them to act. And it's even deterministically, it's a guess. Probabilistically, it's probably a better guess in my opinion. Um, and I get asked a lot like, well, which data set is accurate? Or like, we're doing MTA. Is that accurate? It's like, well, what, what does accurate mean? Like you can't track. Depends on the data. Yeah. yeah. At the end of the day, we're, we're making like educated guesses rooted in, in math and modeling. Um, but we're still just sort of estimating. Yeah. And deterministic's great. The precision is fantastic. The problem is scale. Um, you can't model 12 exposed converters. That's just not enough data, right? You have, and this is where you really need larger data sets. Um, and so I think you have to find that balance between sufficient accuracy with scale, which is generally where you get on the probabilistic side versus, you know, if you, but if you're doing like credit card retargeting, you better have some really precise deterministic data, right? Because those offers are very specific to that person and their situation. So it really depends on the use case and, and the brand specific needs, I think. I'll shut up now, let the other guys talk. <laughs> well, we're actually um, getting close to time where I wanna start taking some questions, but I would love to just throw this out and have each of you answer. Um, starting with Geo. And I think you could, we could answer it, you can choose. Do you wanna answer for the perspective of a brand, like a marketer who's listening right now or an agency um, person who's working on behalf of that brand? What, what do you think is the number one thing they need to do to get ready for these changes? Yeah, I think uh, embracing the future. Um, the, you know, the, the sooner we can embrace new techniques, new methodologies to buy and sell and measure media, uh, the easier it's going to be to, to transition. Um, and, you know, the future has a significant portion of inventory that it will be non-addressable uh, or non-consented. Um, and to me, that's going to be, the, that's the number one thing that is uh, important to start testing, 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 and, uh, and learning on. Uh, the, there's a lot of talks in the industry about IDs, again, deterministic or probabilistic, and that's more on the like preservation side. Uh, but you know, the, the sooner we also embrace the unaddressable supply and we learn how to buy and and you know and measure that, the easier it's gonna be for everybody. And that's like we still work in auctions, right? That supply is gonna be very, very cheap. So it's you know, as, as long as we figure out how to do it a little bit better than our competitors, both as ad tech vendors, agencies, and advertisers, we can develop significant competitive advantages uh, by having, you know, smarter ways to participate in an auction. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just needs to be better than average. <laughs> so you're saying by embrace the change, are you saying, I mean, this is how I'm interpreting it, um, be willing to give up control a little bit and have to just like roll with things as, as they evolve? Um, I'm, I'm not sure it's about control. Um, I think it's more around, you know, the fact that we have to be prepared as an industry to the fact that addressability will go away and is slowly going away for a meaningful portion of supply. And, and you know, as much as we can preserve some of it, it will be a fraction of what we're used to. And if we only focus on that fraction, we will miss out on a huge opportunity on a huge portion of supply and on a huge portion of users that will simply be not reachable anymore. Um, there's, again, there's plenty of vendors, you know, different, uh, different solutions that are trying to uh, address the non-addressable, no, no pun intended. Um, and, you know, I just encourage everybody to like really focus on that uh, slice of the pie because that's, that's the only one that we're sure it's not gonna go away. Uh, in fact, it's gonna grow. Cool. Okay, Mr. Zirko, what's the number one thing brands or agencies should be doing to adapt 
in the near future? Besides coming to the Magenta Audience Network to partner with us. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Um, also in, in, in all seriousness, I think um, finding a partner that knows how to work across multiple ID spaces, across multiple inventory pools, across multiple audience sets, and make sense of those because it's not going to be as, as easy as it is in the existing programmatic environment, I think is, um, it is paramount. The other thing I would say is, we didn't get to really touch on this, but collaborate. Collaborative first party and second party audience solutions, I think can, can give marketers, uh, brands, digital service providers, give an edge that, that Geo was kind of talking about, right? Like there's a, port, a, a pool of inventory out there that is going to remain unaddressable, but but perhaps there's pockets within that that somebody else has first party data on. And if you, if you form those strategic first party partnerships with, um, with collaborators that are like-minded and strategic, you can start to pool first party data sets um, in, into a collaborative audience uh, environment that makes part of that more addressable for your, for your own needs. And then you're, you're contributing some of your first party data as well. To the, to the pool. So I think we'll see some more of that and some of the audience net, I, I think we'll see a renaissance of audience networks. Honestly, we're already seeing that with um, with retail retail networks that have been popping up uh, across the board and, and, and now with Magenta Audience Network, I think th those types of solutions will, um, will, provide, will provide the expertise and the capabilities that uh, the marketers have, have kind of gone away from in in the in the world of programmatic, where you didn't really need uh, you, you didn't really need as much handholding you know, or or technology or expertise to to get at some of some of the specific audience targeting techniques that you were trying to to accomplish. Thanks, Steve. So I'm gonna I'm gonna throw, I'm gonna do a little bit for you if you don't mind. Um, so if you're let's. To the, to the brand marketers out there who work with an agency and don't, and so their agency manages those partnerships for them, what, what should brands be asking of their agencies? Yeah, I was gonna say, um, you know, a, again, there's two sides of the coin here. There's the buying, the addressability, and there's the measurement side. I think it's great that you're coming up with new, you know, the brands are coming up with strategies, or developing strategies for buying, you know, in the new environment, new, new forms of identity, but they got to think about measurement and how we, how important is unbiased measurement? How important is transparency? Um, how important is, is, you know, uh, auditing, uh, separating the, the, the measurement from the buying and, and having an independent objective view of it. Um, are you doing your job? <laughs> if you just, you know, throw in your budget and go play golf, I don't know. Um, it depends on your brand and what you're trying to achieve. But I think we, we think that's really where it starts. And if you care about <clears throat> objectivity, care about transparency, auditability, portability, your data and not, not your data, not being co-opted to use uh, to arm your competitors, then, then you need to, you know, think about maybe not putting all your money inside the wall networks and, and actually, or the garden, I'm thinking of the wall garden specifically, not, not the networks. There are going to be a lot of new interesting um, uh, places to play like what, Brandon speaking about, but we, we think you gotta, you know, if you want uh, transparency, independence, then uh, you gotta think about measurement now, not after the fact. You can't wait till cookies go away start thinking about what are we gonna do from a measurement and optimization? Cause if you can't measure, you can't optimize. You can't optimize your debt, right? Then you're, you're regressing years and years in a matter of weeks. And so get ahead of it. Um, think about this, if cookies are really, really going away sometime in next year, like you don't wanna wait till next year to start testing. You don't wanna test in Q4 unless you're not a seasonal company. Um, you wanna start testing now. You wanna start spinning up new, you know, let's try new ways of delivering personalized and measuring uh, media and, and stitching together data so we can do something intelligent with it. So that's the first thing is, is just that philosophical question. And then I think, you know, we see a lot of insourcing activity taking place. Um, we see it fail so much because I don't think uh, brands sometimes understand how much work and how much expertise is needed. There's a lot of art, not just science, that goes into planning and executing campaigns. So I would say, um, you know, measure twice, cut once before you, you just wholesale. We're just going to, you know, bring all the stuff in house and hire two people thinking we can replace an agency of eight people. It does not work. We've just seen it fail miserably over and over. It can work if you take a very strategic approach, 
even then it's like, you don't need to do everything in house, find out what's core for you. And then what makes sense to have the right partners. Cause again, we're still, you know, source where you get the best bang for your buck. And, and that's going to you know, ultimately the, the way to do the most with your limited budget. So um, I don't know, I have other ideas, but I'll stop there. Thank you. I agree with you, by the way, about not in housing everything. Although I've seen models that work when it's, when it's, a, it's a hybrid. Um, yeah. we have a little less than 10 minutes left. I'd love to take uh, some questions from the audience now. And here's our first one. Uh, how do we feel about GA4 as a measurement solution identity? As a measurement solution to identify unique users? I've never heard of GA4. I think that's the new version of Google Analytics, I believe. Um, I mean, Google Analytics still operates in the context of a, a website with, with first party cookies. Uh, so to the extent that uh, brands a, have a website where they capture conversions uh, and B, only care about, you know, last click in, in session conversions, um, Google Analytics remains, a, you know, a great solution. Um, it does not apply for um, a lot of brands that don't sell direct to consumer on their website that have a, a different uh, objective and, objectives and KPIs or that have long uh, paths to conversion and are interested in getting a better understanding of the, the upper funnel as well. Um, so, you know, Google is making some changes to preserve some of the capabilities of Google Analytics, but, you know, it's, it's still only a small piece of the puzzle in the same way that it was a small piece of the puzzle in the past uh, and has only been, you know, uh, focusing on the, the lower funnel uh, conversions and not, you know, the broader picture. Yeah. So one weapon in the arsenal, but not a single bullet. <laughs> Do you think they'll call GA4, GA360 for? Kidding. It's a little joke. Google names that change. Um, yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. Like, we work with so many clients that are either like CPG, um, don't own the sale, do not have first party data. Um, don't, like, who goes to a website to look up, you know, to learn about like cans of soup, for example? Um, so yeah, I, I agree with you. It's, it'll work. That's a great solution for some parts of some clients' businesses, but it, it can't be a holistic solution for the industry. Um, we have time for more. Any other questions out there? Feel free to type them in. While we're waiting. Uh, I have a question for you, Sarah. What are your customers, your clients asking about? What, what's on their minds when they're think, seeing all these headlines and thinking about it? I mean, the number one question is, like, we're doing, you know, everything we're doing right now from a, a point that you're managing for us, like, what is gonna be okay? What can we continue to do? We're doing measurement, you know, a lot of our, a lot of um, our clients, we measure across the funnel. So we'll have um, ad effectiveness studies that are survey based with exposed control methodology to be measuring things like lift and you know awareness, familiarity, intent, purchase intent, consideration, things like that. Will that still work? Like, does that rely on third party cookies? Um, and there's not a clear answer to that, right? So, like, what things are we doing today that are not going to work in the future? And what are we doing to like come up with a plan B? That is the number one question. And I think. This is so complex. Um, you know, we're data people. You get, we're all tech data people, yep. but not all of not of all, all of our clients are their marketers or even you know agency folks that are that are really great at comm strategy and planning. It's just like, wait, what made with that? Just tell me what to do. You know what I mean? So I think that's kind of it's it's just so complex and it's so technical. And it's just like I just want to know how things are gonna work. One thing I would say we've seen is some of the analytics uh, firms, uh, the, the really big, the, I won't say names because for protect the innocent, but um, they are really concerned because they realize that for all their customers that are on Google, for example, campaign manager, their the log file data that powers all their analytics routines goes away. Um, and, and even if they got log files with no cookie associated with it, it's, it's, just, it's just campaign data, right? So uh, without identity. So they're, 
now, you know, doing a lot of exploration and looking at new solutions, ways to, it's not about future proofing. We think we use the word safeguarding. Like it's, you need to safeguard your data um, and your ability to have an objective view of, of your performance, right? And, and not to rely on your biggest media vendors to also tell you how your media is performing or to take credit for things that they may or may not have influenced. And so I would say that again, back to measurement, you know, the buy, there's gonna be so many buying options, so many opportunities, lots of things to unpack on that side the next 12 months. Uh, but the one thing that all of those things you're gonna do, you're still gonna have to, someone's gonna have to answer the question, how are we gonna measure performance of these things? And do we have a framework or uh, identity stitching solution that's gonna help us do that um, in a cookie-less world without identifiers? And that's, um, or mobile identifiers. So I think that that, Kind of that's where we're seeing now some of the analytics firms really, and the consulting firms, the big names, uh, are all very focused on this right now. They're all looking for POVs, are developing their POVs to tell their big clients, like, in a cookie world, this world, these are things you have to think about. These things you have to start really planning for now because you don't want to wait till, you know, Q1, Q2 of next year to start thinking about it. It's going to be too late. And, and those that get ahead of it are going to have a major competitive advantage over those that are still trying to figure this out next year. So. Yeah. All right, I have another question, and I'm so glad that you asked this, Julie, because I almost, I almost, I don't know why I didn't, I almost had you guys explain. Please define made. In mobile advertising uh, identifiers, which is the common name for the uh, Apple uh, advertising ID, uh, aka the IDFA, uh, and the Google advertising ID, which is GPSA ID. Um, those were are still the um, device specific identifiers that can be used for advertising uh, when the user has given uh, consent. Uh, so in the case of uh, Android, they are still present in the majority of the supply. In the case of Apple, since 14.5 and now 14.6 um, software being rolled out, uh, we see them present in less than a fourth uh, of all uh, iOS supply um, because the users are not, you know, giving consent to, to tracking. Uh, and so they, they were better than cookies because they were built to be universal and uh, stable across all apps, uh, but they're also going away as, as fast, if not faster <laughs> than, than cookies are. Yeah. On iOS, anyway. On iOS, yeah. Google is always the two or three years behind. Uh, so I guess we'll, we'll see in 2023. But, but I, I don't think, I don't know where the time, but I don't think that the, the made will, will necessarily meet the same fate as the cookie. I think it's ultimately a, a more superior ID. Uh, it, it, it is controllable at the device level for the user. It's also resettable. We may see, we may see Google and Apple come out with ways to, to control portions of how, how the, the maids are used. Maybe, maybe they're more frequently reset, dynamically reset, et cetera, things like that. Um, but, I, but I think they are truly a, a superior identifier that, that, will, that will persist even if it's in an opt-in form uh, in the future. All right, well, it's one o'clock, so that is a wrap. Thank you guys so much for joining today. It was really a pleasure to talk to you about this. Um, and thank you all for attending. We hope you learned something um, and everyone have a great rest of the day. Thanks for having thank us. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Sarah. Enjoyed it. Thanks, San Fran. Thanks for listening, well. yeah.